Hello, and welcome back to my channel. Today I'd like to be doing a vlog form of a blog post, which I wrote in July of 2021 called Gay Men and the Divine. Comedy, and I would like to apologize. I know the lighting in my videos isn't really the best, but I unfortunately don't have much choice about where I'm able to shoot my vlogs because I'm not in my own home at the moment. When I first read The Divine Comedy at 24, I wasn't exactly happy to see gay men depicted in hell. But now that my prefrontal cortex is fully developed, and because I've done a lot of supplemental study, I'm able to see this aspect of the poem in a markedly different light. Dante's views on homosexuality are quite nuanced and sympathetic for someone born in 1265. Yes, he does depict his dear teacher and mentor, Brunetto Latini, in the third ring of the seventh circle of hell, where so-called sodomites are punished. But this part of hell, more generally, is for those who've been violent against nature, God, and art. Some modern scholars believe the real reason Brunetto shows up there is because he was violent against his native tongue, a Tuscan Florentine Italian, by writing a book, Les Livres du Tresor, in French. While Dante himself wrote a number of books in Latin, that was Europe's lingua franca. It would be some centuries until French eclipsed Latin in that regard. Other scholars feel Brunetto was placed there to show how even the greatest of people may be guilty of private sins, whatever they may be. After all, Brunetto is treated more lovingly and respectfully than almost anyone else in Inferno, apart, of course, from Virgil. And there was an obvious bond of love and intellectual kinship between Dante and Brunetto in real life. Brunetto is also the only person in Inferno with whom Dante uses voy, the formal form of you. Unfortunately, English doesn't really have that anymore. Even the Quakers no longer say thee and thou. They generally just like use you for everybody these days. And we don't really have a consistent plural form of you either in English, except from regionalisms like yins or yous guys or y'all or you lot in um, England. In recent years, a love poem, some believe, Brunetto sent to poet Blondie Diu Taiuti, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing the French correctly, was discovered, but the intent may be open to interpretation. After all, many close friends in bygone eras expressed their love for one another, both physically and in words, in ways that suggest romantic or sexual feelings to modern people, but weren't seen as such historically, let alone considered in that way by the friends themselves. And maybe I would just like to talk a little bit about um, Brunetta Latini, if you don't know who he was. This is also a blog post I wrote for my um, blogging from A to Z April this past April for letter L, and I also kind of plagiarized it from the B letter I wrote in my um, names blog post in 2016 when I was doing um, names from the Divine Comedy. I featured Brunetto on the B day. Beatrice was the um, female name for the B day. I always do um, two names and my names blog in April A to Z so I can be like fair to both sexes and I alternate which sex each day starts like if I start with a male name then have a female name second the next day we'll have the female name first and the male name second for example like things like that. So um, Brunetto was born to a noble Tuscan family in Florence which was known as um, Fiorenza in the Middle Ages around um, 1220. His father was Bonacorsa Latini and his grandfather was Latino Latini. By 1254, he was the scribe for the elders in the Florentine municipality. Brunetto also was active in the city's political life and belonged to the Guelph party, which that's a whole other topic. The Guelphs and the Ghibellines and the White Guelphs and the Black Guelphs, perhaps I'll have a future vlog on those topics as well. So respected and beloved was Brunetto by his fellow Florentines. He was part of a delegation sent to the court of King Alfonso X of Castile, Leon, and Galicia in 1259 or 1260 to plead for aid to the Guelph agents against their Ghibelline enemies. The mission wasn't a success. And on his way home from Spain, a student from Bologna told him about the Guelph's recent defeat at the Battle of Monteperti. With this rival party in power, Brunetto was forced into exile. He lived in France from 1261 to 1268 and worked as a notary in various cities. During his French sojourn, he wrote Tesoretto, an Italian encyclopedia, and Les Livres du Tresor, a French encyclopedia. The latter is regarded as the very first encyclopedia in a modern European language. Brunetto also translated four of Cicero's works into Italian, and I should be um, inserting around here some at least one page of an illuminated manuscript on showing Les Livres du Tresor. It's a really beautiful book, so many medieval Manuscripts have beautiful illustrations and calligraphies and little drawings and such around the margins and the borders. When the political situation improved in 1269, he returned to Florence and served in a variety of high offices for the next 20 years. In 1273, 
he received compensation for the wrong done to him in the form of being appointed secretary of the Council of the Republic of Florence. Brunetto was one of the most frequently appointed speakers in general councils. Following the death of Dante's father, Alighiero di Bellincione, between 1281 through 1283, Brunetto became Dante's guardian. Dante and many others identified Brunetto as his teacher, not really a, like a school teacher or, like, or a tutor, just you know someone he studied and learned with on his own time after he was like out officially out of school because school generally finished around age 14 or maybe 15 in those areas and generally usually men but sometimes like a rare few women would go to university as young as 14 years old because that's you know just how their education was structured in those days. There was a clear bond of love and intellectual kinship between the two. Brunetto passed away in 1294 or 1295 leaving a daughter Bianca Latini his tomb is in the church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Florence. I mean, you know, obviously, I've mentioned just previously, you know, despite the powerful love and respect between mentor and mentee, Dante depicts Brunetto in hell, and there's like a whole like scholarly discussion and controversy about why that may have been, whether or not he was gay or not. And, you know, Dante lovingly speaks of Brunetto as his teacher and mentor and offers to sit with him while the rest of Brunetto's group runs off. Brunetto has to refuse because he's condemned to keep aimlessly moving. He then tells Dante's future. Brunetto's section of hell is for people who have been violent against God, nature, and art, and unfortunately, given the attitudes of the era, includes gay men. But there's zero evidence beyond rumors that Brunetto was gay or bisexual, and Brunetto himself expressed homophobic views in Tesoretto. So what is he doing here? And some scholars, as I mentioned, they believe Brunetto was truly placed there because he was violent against art in his native language, because he wrote an entire encyclopedia in French instead of Italian, and as I also previously mentioned, they feel it might be proof of how even the greatest of people might be guilty of private sins, whatever they may be, and then discusses the love poem he possibly wrote to this um, French, I believe he was French, the name looks and sounds French, but possibly he was like Occitane, Occitane, or Provençal, like in those different parts of French, not like French French. Dante not only doesn't condemn de gay men as deviants, degenerates, perverts, etc., he also puts an equal number of gay and straight men in the seventh tariff of purgatory for the lustful. Everyone in purgatory is guaranteed eventual entrance to paradise, so Dante clearly had a much more modern, nuanced view of homosexuality than sexuality that most people associate with the Middle Ages. And then getting back to the main poem about um, gay men and the Divine Comedy. For obvious reasons, it's often difficult to definitively prove historical figures were gay or lesbian, and Brunetto is no exception. We have nothing but this um, poem, whatever its true intentions. Rumors of the time, and his inclusion of the, uh, in a part of hell which punishes more than just so-called sodomites. We also need to be careful about applying modern definitions and concepts to historical figures. Of course, gays, lesbians, and bisexuals have always existed, and there are definitely more than a few historical people whom we obviously clearly know from overwhelming evidence definitely were like lesbian, gay or bisexual, not just applying modern conceptions or like misinterpreting like things they wrote in letters to friends. Oh, I kiss and embrace you a million times, my dear. That's then things they weren't intending it to be intended sexual or romantic, but just modern people view those words in that way. But, you know, a lot of other people, people think might have been, you know, gay or lesbian or bisexual in the past. They generally weren't. It's just, you know, you have to learn how to look at the evidence and not apply this like modern um, standard to everything. This unmodern conception of sexual orientation is relatively recent. Like, for example, we, uh, most probably most people know um, many adult men slept with teen boys in ancient Greece, and that was held as an important coming of age ritual, education, and mentorship, not because they consider themselves same sex attraction, and they would be kind of shocked if modern people told them, hey, you guys are like gay or bisexual because you're doing this. No, that's just, you know, what everyone did. They didn't apply any special label to it, and they would generally, like, sleep with women at all other times in their lives. So, you know, you have to be careful about, like, you know, presentism and projecting modern attitudes and views onto people in the past, no matter how badly you want to claim them for your own team. There are plenty of, you know, historical, like, verified gays and lesbians whom you can, like, proudly look at, but some, many pe other people, they generally just aren't if you look at the evidence or sometimes it's the lack of evidence you're just like interpreting it in a way you want because that's the conclusion you want to come to and this is also applicable for many other like things and people throughout history not just like historical gays and lesbians even the very word homosexual didn't exist until 1869 
The word sodomite was used because of a false connection to the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. In contrast, the Jewish teaching has always been very clear that their sin was lack of hospitality and had nothing to do with sexual behavior, although I obviously am very well aware the Christian interpretation of this um, sin and the destruction of those cities is extremely different from the traditional um, Jewish perspective. But wait, there's more. In the very next canto, which, um, by the way, um, Brunetto's canto in Inferno is canto 15, so the next canto would be canto 16, Dante meets three more so-called sodomites, who are also fellow Florentines, Jacopo Rusticucci, Guido Guerra, and Tegiaio Aldobrandini. After they introduce themselves, Dante says, and this is the uh, Mark Musa translation, If I could have been sheltered from the fire, I would have thrown myself below with them, and I think my guide would have allowed me to. But as I knew I would be burnt and seared, my fear went over my first good intention that made me want to put my arms around them. And then I spoke. Repulsion, no, but grief for your condition spread throughout my heart, and years will pass before it fades away. At first glance, this doesn't seem any different than his sympathy for other people he's encountered, like Francesca da Rimini in Chaco del Anguilaia. But when he takes pity on someone, it's because of their conduct reminds him of his own behavior. Like, for example, He's so moved by Francesca's story of indulging forbidden love because he himself loved a woman who wasn't his wife, a married woman no less. An essay in the Derling Martinez translation, which is considered by many to be the current gold standard for many reasons, even if like some people prefer a more like gently creative translation because it's a little more like poetic and beautiful, not quite so literal all the time, suggests this is Dante's way of admitting he's had sexual desires for other men but fought not to satisfy this curiosity in their and you can obviously take or leave any like, essay or note or whatever in a translation with a grain of salt. That's just that person's uh, opinion based on their interpretation of things. Like, for example, the Hollander's translation believes like Dante is like making fun of Virgil throughout the poem. And obviously there are like things where he's, you know, having some fun at his expense. And he does like start to make more and more like mistakes, not know what to do in purgatory. I just see that as, you know the way he chose character development, not because he's saying, oh, ha, ha, look at this, like, silly person who wasn't a Christian. Let's show him being, like, stupid and silly all the time. No, I don't believe in that at all. And there are other scholars who believe Dante was, like, felt embarrassed of his feelings for Beatrice, and he was publishing La Vita Nuova to kind of make fun of his younger self and show the folly of, like, having a crush on someone that badly. I also don't believe that view in the, the Durling Martinez translations, um, essay on Dante possibly having like gay or bisexual feelings which he probably didn't indulge they don't like think there's any evidence he did like ever indulge these things they tr they don't translate it him as saying like he wanted to put his arms around these three other men he encounters they say he was greedy to embrace them which kind of cast the thing in a whole new light not just saying oh I would love to you know genuinely hug them because that was a respectful greeting. You know, he's greedy to embrace them so that possibly could suggest, you know, sexual desires to people who are inclined to interpret in that way. In stark contrast to most other depictions of hell in that era, and indeed into the modern era, there are no sexualized torches of either women or men in Inferno. The closest we get is the scene of thief Agnel being turned into a snake in Canto 25. Then something very curious happens in Canto 26 of Purgatorio, on the seventh terrace. Here, where the lustful purify themselves, are equal numbers of gay and straight men, and also possibly because, you know, this is, in by and large part, a poem about men. Women generally aren't mentioned that much, but when they are, they do, you know, speak for themselves and have moral agency, and Dante treats them with a great deal of respect and sympathy, as I've mentioned previously. There are possibly also women on this terrace as well, they're not, they're just not mentioned, and presumably there would be equal numbers of straight women and lesbians there as well. Everyone in purgatory is guaranteed eventual entrance to paradise, so Dante clearly didn't think homosexuality or bisexuality were truly a sin. In fact, many of the souls in purgatory committed similar acts to those punished in hell. The difference is that souls in purgatory admit they're wrong instead of dying without remorse or blaming other people. And many people genuinely don't understand this, even people who are Catholic or Christian them, themselves. He, he wasn't just, you know, like getting off on like condemning people to hell. Oh, you did this and this and this. That's a horrible sin. You're a terrible person. No, it's the, you know, the reason they committed the sins and what they felt about it later. And it's kind of like a moral warning in the whole, you know, contrapasso thing. Their punishment reminds them of what they didn't realize. So it's a lot more, you know, complex and just, oh, ha ha, look, he sent his 
enemies to hell and he's some kind of moral puritan who thinks all these people committed sins for doing x y and z and i know you just you know have to learn to read it in a much more like nuanced light and do outside study you know you can't just read it at face value and read you know without a teacher or good notes and such like that there's also a distinction between the motivation and manifestation of these same acts like for example souls in the second circle of hell conducted illicit love affairs the people on the seventh terrace of purgatory just loved too intensely and didn't channel their natural sexual desires for the same or opposite sex through the best channels it's not about the act itself, but how one chooses to pursue it and why. Given the air attitudes of his heir, Dante could have easily left gay men out of purgatory, meted out sexual tortures to the one in hell, which would have been entirely in line with contrapasso, a punishment reminding the souls of their sins, and castigated them as perverts, deviants, degenerates, etc. Yet he treats them with great respect and even feels sympathy for them. So if we watch to the end, um, Thank you very much. Hopefully I'm getting better at editing and shooting videos as I go along. I do hope to possibly get some better lighting in the near future so I won't look, you know, half dark and half light. And I'm hopefully going to learn how to insert text into specific frames if I can also do that because I do know how to finally, like, edit out frames when possible and insert images. I Hopefully my next um, vlog will be on the It Can't Be books tag and then I'll be doing some more Dante and post in the future and maybe a couple of other book reviews. For example, I'm looking forward to um, this, talking about um, The Play of God by Devi Vanamali, which is about the life of Krishna. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. So hopefully I will um, see you guys again on Monday. So thanks for tuning in. Oh, and please um, consider um, liking, um, subscribing, um, commenting, and sharing because I really am hoping to build my channel and I can't um, start doing my um, series on the Decameron unless I have like significant enough like subscribers and commenters so I know I wouldn't be doing that in vain so see you guys very soon thanks bye